I think there's no doubt that Robert is one of the great artists of the century. Rodin and Maillot, Calder, Pomodoro, Giacometti, Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, and Robert Davidson. Robert Davidson's precision with a paintbrush and a carving tool is as technical and beautiful as work can be. He is a rock star of native art moving into the realm of just being an artist, period. Can I ask you how, how you were drawn to this subject, what your relationship to this subject is? Well, I, I don't know if you recall a few years ago, I was at the festival there in uh, Stornoway with a previous film called How to Guy on the Edge of the World. And that film was about an archipelago, much like the Outer Hebrides is. And it has a distinct culture, again, like, like yours is. And I was captivated by that place because being remote, more remote from, from the influences of, of the mainland, people seem to be capable of making decisions that stuck. Uh, rather than getting, you know, wrapped up in the endless debate that happens, you know, when you've got so many voices and so many influences on the mainland. So the people in Haida Gwaii seem to be capable of, of choosing to live, you know, more simply and uh, paying much more attention to um, um, sustainable practices and uh, um, living kind of green. And I was really impressed by that. So um, we met Robert Davidson uh, during that that picture, during that, that previous film. And uh, I was just so impressed with what a cool guy he is. And uh, I'd admired his work for you know, my, my whole life. And I started realizing as I looked around, not just you know, the, the city that I live in, Vancouver in Canada, but also the surrounding areas all the way down the coast into California and so forth, uh, up into Alaska as well, that the public display of Aboriginal art it certainly had grown exponentially, like we have so much of it on the streets and everywhere, but that it was now being adopted by a new generation of environmentalists, which saw in it a very eloquent uh, plea for treating the environment, the natural world with more care. And that's a cause that is something that I think is pretty relevant right now. So uh, that struck me as being a really perfect way to, to tell that story. So, so the story kind of, uh, as it were, uh, Robert Davidson, and to a large extent as well, his extended family, who are also very much engaged in these um, uh, activities, is in a way a vehicle for that bigger picture, for that for that bigger story. Um, I, I I don't think I'm I'm speaking out of turn or speaking. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but Robert, in his speaking and in his work he speaks of considering himself a conduit for the wisdom of the ancients, his ancestors, who lived sustainably for, you know, I don't know what they're saying, 9,000 years now, whatever, it could be forever, on this piece of land, and in a pretty equitable way, for the most part. And so he thinks that that message is more relevant today than it ever was. And he feels that the work that he does is bringing those ideas of the ancestors into the current conversation. And um, that struck me as being just brilliant. Yeah, it, it, it's very interesting because it, it raises so many questions about the power of, of, a, of a message, of an image. Um, that there's a, a very strong part in the film where they where Robert Davidson talks about trying to find that image that creates change. Um, yeah. that, that's that's a, an incredibly powerful idea. Um, I suppose we're all familiar with it because it's in all of our lives in the in the Western world, certainly. But but I, I think that's an, a, an incredible moment in the film where he strives for that for that image. And he, you know, that's interesting that you point that out. And he's found that image on, on, on numerous occasions. His image, like, for example, our prime minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, has a tattoo on his, I think, right shoulder that is a Robert Davidson design, which he put there without asking permission for. But that's another story. Um, you'll see, again, that protest marches and, and the environmental rallies and so forth that we're seeing with increasing frequency as our world, you know, sets on fire over here. 
Um, people are wearing the images. It, 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 they're becoming cool. Like back in the 60s, people wore the nuclear disarmament peace sign. That, that was an image that captivated the world. And it, it people coalesced around that. Well, people here are coalescing around these indigenous images, which really speak to having respect for the natural world and real, reassessing our place in it. Are we at the top of the totem pole? Clearly not. In Robert's work, man exists on the totem pole, but he's often nowhere near the top. He yeah. considers us to be part of creation, which I think is a much healthier attitude. No? Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's not just it's not just images and art. It's, it's actually power and empowerment, isn't it? It's the outcome. It's it's almost like the image acts as that that um, signifier of uh, cohesion in a community. But it also seems to channel power that that things happen after people rediscover or reinvent that image or that sort of rooted image and um your film de depicts a number of examples in in the locality where that power has created change could you just sort of talk us through one or two of those because particularly struck about the kind of the ocean and the forest and so on and, and the powers that those communities have taken to preserve their their environment which they previously didn't have well, I think um, a, a fellow filmmaker who's featured in the film, Nettie Wilde, who's a, a wonderful uh, a colleague, she did a project which is in our film, uh, which is uh, the salmon. And it's projected on one of the largest bridges in the city. And every night, thousands of people, all um, two summers ago, and now it's back again, would come and watch this. It's a, a sort of an AV presentation. Very, very beautiful. But I mean, here you're looking at Thousands of white people who have really no connection with the indigenous world are sitting there enthralled by this imagery, which is indigenous imagery. I mean, the salmon is a, a, an integral part of, of coastal indigenous culture here, but it's now become, because of that, an integral part of white or settler culture as well. And so that's a case where these images, which have been gradually becoming more and more prolific, are are getting more and more people who really are not they're not you know first nations they're not indigenous to get on board with that idea that if the salmon don't come back we're kind of in trouble you know um the same thing with the birds you know if the if the eagles and the ravens aren't here it means it's you know the canary in the coal mine thing that message is filtering through and that message has power yeah i, th I thought it was another very interesting thing about this i i, I think you film um, create some some very interesting questions uh, about the filmmaker and the filmmaker's process as well in this um, ar around these subjects. Can I ask you to what extent you in any way pre uh, pre planned, as it were, the storyline such as it is of this, or or did you find that that Robert Davidson and the others in this film kind of led you through that? process of structure and of content and that you were in a, in a way kind of uh, uh, following their lead in that and the end result is quite different to where you might have thought it would be you know well you know when I started a movie I, it always begins with a pitch not not just to the people who finance it but also to the people that I work with and very often Almost all the time, people will shake their heads and go, I don't really get it, but you sound really interested, so let's give it a try, right? Then when we get to the end and the picture's finished, I go, you see, that's what I'm talking about. But in truth, uh, of course, uh, uh, Robert and Terry Lynn and, and Ben and, and uh, Reg, they all very much uh, led the narrative. I, I did start out knowing that what I wanted to do, because I'm sure that you'll understand that this area can be kind of fraught. In an age where cultural appropriation, we're starting to realize what a serious mistake that's been. Um, I wanted to make certain from the very beginning that I didn't appropriate, you know, anything from the culture or or uh, Robert's voice, and didn't sort of use him to make a point that I want to make. I was more interested in hearing what he. Had. I was entirely interested in what Robert and and his community had to say, but also. I wanted to make clear from the very beginning, and I think this is something that makes the film kind of unusual. I wanted to make clear that I felt that the story is the impact that Robert's work and the indigenous art of, of our coast is having on the rest of society. You know, I, I wasn't speaking as an insider. This film is not, I don't sort of like pretend that I'm a hider or something, because I'm not. I have close connections with the community, but I wanted to talk about the impact that that's having 
on me and on the rest of the people in the non-Indigenous community. And so that was a really key note in the, in the film. So the questions that I asked Robert, the questions I asked all the people, uh, and the stuff I filmed kind of radiated out from that. That was a pretty central uh, narrative thread to it. But no, Robert, I mean, he's such a powerful character. He led us off in some of the most interesting, as you see, directions, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of the footage, um, some of the additional footage in, in your film is also quite amazing. The um, Particularly the things about the raising of the first totem pole, uh, uh, as it's called, um, uh, you know, in, in what had been a very, very long period of time for that community. What 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 an incredible event. Um, I mean, do, do you think Robert Davidson arrived at a moment when he was kind of needed, or do you think he kind of ushered in that moment, or was it a sort of a, a mixture of both? That's a really cool comment, Steve. That I like that. Um, I think that Robert arrived at a moment in history where we were ready to listen because he'd been saying that, and, and artists like him, going back to Edie Shaw and all of them, had been saying this for a long time. But Robert, he arrived at the right moment in history, but also, his genius is that he's able to translate ideas that other people presented merely as pretty pictures. Robert was able to, to present those to us with a, a, a window into the much deeper meaning that they had. Yeah. And I think that to, to Robert's brilliance is that you look at his work and yeah, it's beautiful. It's incredibly well-crafted and it's just awe-inspired, but it doesn't take long for you to realize that there's a lot more going on. There's quite a few layers. Like until I'd worked with Robert, I'd never honestly really looked at a totem pole and tried to understand what was being said. Now, what I realize is the totem pole is a movie. You know, you, you look at it and there's a big story being told and you can spend all kinds of time figuring out what it is. And it's very rewarding to do so. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it's a it's it's a, a type of movie that that can't exist without community input i mean it just simply the amount of people it takes to raise one of those things i mean there's a, there's sort of a, a, an implicit buy-in in a community in that sort of art isn't there it's not something you could do as a as a loner as an outsider well you can make it that way perhaps yeah. but you might have a problem getting a log that big into your studio but <laughs> on your own but but the community is then involved in i presume the idea of a permanent location as well the the, the sites where these things go are well community is, is vitally important in the work that that robert does and it's kind of a metaphor for how uh, uh, some indigenous culture i think most indigenous cultures work that um, they don't do top-down stuff very well. They, 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 everything is really community-oriented, and unless there's a consensus, it kind of doesn't happen. And I know it's really frustrating for white people sometimes that they have to listen to every grandmother express their opinion on whether there should be a wind farm here or a solar installation there or, or a park here or there. But at the end of the day, if there's community buy-in, th th it's accepted and promoted in a way that we rarely see it here. So, uh, yeah, the community, I mean, Robert consults with, you know, a wide uh, range of people before he even starts and asks what the right way to do it is and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as well these kinds of objects, you know, when we talk about power and community and cohesion and, and so on, the extent to which they also operate as a kind of a battery, you know, they store a certain kind of energy across across generations as well don't they? the things that you could kind of charge you know and i suppose in the making we see that process of the imbuing with that stored energy you know which then discharges itself over a, a millennia you know in in its supposed the battery, science. the battery analogy is an excellent one i think robert would probably really really praise that because it is like the battery, the wisdom of, of, of the ancients coming forward is a battery and it does energize, it energizes us if we'll, if we'll just plug into it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how it strikes me that that's how the, the, it's a battery of kind of universal usefulness as well, because people from outside of this community can also often unwittingly be affected by it in ways I think that they might not even comprehend when they first encounter, you know. And I think that's mirrored as well in the sense that there has been a um, a big return to interest in 
things that in a generalised way we would call as shamanism and so on, you know, of the knowledge that's transported um, across barriers and times and so on, you know. And, and, I mean, would you put, would that be a useful way to think of Robert Davidson? Should we think of him as a kind of a, a shaman in a way? I think you could consider Robert's message to be shamanistic, I think, or shamanistic, um, because he does speak in, in, through his art with that voice in the sense that it, the work challenges us to look at the way we are and the way we could be. And so in very concrete terms, some of the things that come across to me from the work are, are the central role or the role of man in, in the world. You know, in Genesis, we're presented in the, in the Christian Bible with the idea that you know, God gives man ownership over everything that crawls on the earth and swims in the sea and flies through the air to do with pretty much as we want. Well, that's not the way in, in shamanistic societies. They see us as part of this continuum, right? And we're by no means the boss, and we have to find a way of fitting into that. And that's very, very strong in this message. Another thing is, is the idea that in Western culture, the concept of old is that's pejorative, like it's synonymous with that, oh, it's so old, right? Whereas in, in that uh, shamanistic culture, there are no young, young shamans, there, 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 there's no such thing. And they respect the elders when they talk sense, because some old people are, you know, idiots, like, <laughs> but, uh, but not everybody who's old is wise, but certainly they don't despise people because they're old. And that's something that our, our culture, I think, really, really could pay closer attention to. Somebody told me the other day that in Amish society, that the elders convene and consider each new technical innovation before they allow it to be adopted into their community. And so I found myself thinking, I wonder if we had had a system like that, if we would have adopted social media. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Would we have adopted television even? My dad used to call it the idiot box, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and can I tell you what? What? what um, I mean, we're very lucky at Hebrides International Film Festival to be giving a, a, a UK premiere to 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 your film, which is hugely exciting and a and a, and a great honour. But what has been the reaction to your film around the world? And and um, has, has anything in that surprised you? Has anything arisen out of that reaction that you weren't a kind of kind of expecting? Well, uh, the reaction to the film has been unusual in the sense that, you know, I've been making films my whole life. You make a film, you release it to the festival circuit, you get reviews, and people say, oh, it's wonderful, you're great, or they say, I don't know, or they say, it's terrible, you're awful. In this case, the film has been really successful. People seem to really, really like it. That It's won quite a number of awards at festivals, and it gets audience awards. But I don't think it's me that they're, they're, they're praising. I think it's Robert. I, I've watched him because he comes to screenings. People just love the guy. He's so cool. He's just the coolest guy. You want to be like him. And whenever he talks, he's slow and he's quiet. But people just hang on every word. So I, 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 that's unusual for me because, you know, I've never made a biopic before. This is a movie about a person. And uh, I'd like to think that when people cheer, they're cheering for me. But I don't think so. They're cheering for Robert. <laughs> Well, look, it, it, it's such a such a strong film, and I, I feel very lucky to to have seen it, and we feel very lucky to have it in our program. So, and uh, thank you very much for for doing this, um, and uh, I look forward to communicating with you again on the next time you're you're uh, uh, part of Hebrides International Film Festival. And um, thank well, you, thank so you, much, Charles. It's a real honour for us to have this film doing its UK premiere at the Hebrides Film Festival. I've been there before, and I, I love it there. Uh, honestly, I could, I could live there, and uh, I wish I was there right now. So thank you so much for this honor, and I really hope that everybody watching it uh, gets a little feeling for what it's like on this side of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Pete.